gal that used to work here on staff at Calvary South Denver a good, wow, 15 years ago. Her name was Nicole, Nicole Castaneda. Does anyone remember Nicole in, in, in here? Well, let me give you a little glimpse about Nicole for those that are raising your hand. This woman is a prayer warrior, always praying for everything. And inevitably, uh, she would always ask us the question, did you pray about it? Well, I remember one particular moment in, on staff, I lost my keys and I was frantic and I was stressed and I'm just like a normal person when you lose your keys, you don't lose your keys and go, I'm really happy right now, no, you're stressed out. So I'm looking around like, where's my keys, where's my keys? And Nicole comes out of nowhere and she goes, did you pray about it? I was like, I need to pray about it. I lost my keys. What do you, what do you, what do you, you need to pray about it. And then just like walked away. Stressed out. I didn't pray about it. Why? I don't need to pray about it. I just need to remember where my keys were. Sure enough. All right, Lord, please bring to memory where I put my keys because I'm stressing out. Wait a second. I think I know where they are. And sure enough, I look in the very spot and there's the keys. And then Nicole comes out of nowhere and she's like, see, I told you. And she vanished. It was the weirdest thing. <laughs> And then someone was like, Nicole hasn't worked here in 10 years. That didn't happen. But what did constantly happen is this reminder, and that was always the joke after that. Did you pray about it? Did you pray about it? Even what seems like the simplest, smallest tact. Oh, I don't want to bug God about this. Well, did you pray about it? Because the Bible says, you know, we cast our cares on him because he cares. And in a time, especially like right now, series of events, difficulties, challenges, daily crisis, we go through this motion and we ask the question, is God actually in control? Because it doesn't feel like it. And we talked about this in, in depth last week, the subject of whether or not God was in fact in control. Because depending on the crisis, we will often ask did God's plans change? Were they altered? And if the book of Acts has taught us anything, because by the way, we started this book 26 weeks ago, of the 425 verses that we have studied, verse by verse, if there's anything we've learned from this book thus far, is that obstacles create opportunities for the church and have thus far. And it's created opportunities for us as a church to pray, to know how to talk to God about really hard subjects. And, and when you think about the book of Acts, Acts 12 started with a crisis. James was killed by a sword. Peter was imprisoned. And we learned in the fifth verse of chapter 12 that constant prayer was offered on behalf of Peter. And their prayers were answered. Peter escaped from prison. An angel literally busted him out of prison and the early church's prayers were answered. But you know what happens is for a lot of us, we treat prayer like it's this thing that's gonna work sometimes. And then when it does work, quote unquote, we go, this prayer thing works? I need to do this more often because <laughs> I didn't realize it was a thing that actually worked. And in this morning, we're gonna see not only is prayer effective and quote unquote works, and we're gonna measure based on what I think the Bible tells us concerning prayer, we're gonna see in the 12th chapter that their prayers are answered. And for a lot of them, not in the way that they thought it would be answered. And for a lot of them, exactly the way that they intended it to be answered. So let's begin in verse 12 of chapter 12. Read it with me, won't you? So when he had considered this, this is Peter, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So we begin the verse with, he considered this. Well, what, what is he considering? Well, Peter's considering how he broke out of prison, how he was asleep and an angel had to strike him on the side, shine a bright light into the prison cell, unshackle the chains from his wrists, let him walk past four guards into the, the city where the iron gate was. And he's considering this. He's like, what the heck just happened? And of course, we learned last week that once he considered what happened, he realized, oh, God truly has sent an angel to free me and God's in control of this very moment. And here in verse 12, as he's considering these things happen, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So we have some people coming into the, the picture. And the Bible's very intentional to write names for some people and not for write names about others. Like the group was there and the people heard. But in this case, we see Mary and John Mark come in. And John Mark, he was the cousin of Barnabas. 
Barnabas was introduced at the beginning of Acts. We're going to see that uh, John Mark is going to accompany Saul, who's going to become Paul the Apostle, and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. We're going to read about that next Sunday in the 13th chapter. But then we learn about Mary. Mary's introduced. Now, she is an important picture, uh, individual in the early church and the foundations of it. Uh, she opened up her house constantly. We see that her home becomes the headquarters to the church. She lived in the upper part of Jerusalem. Uh, when we visited Jerusalem a couple years ago, in 2018, we were able to see some excavated ruins of homes that were very much like what's described here. And a lot of them were shockingly larger than what we would, would expect. And in Mary's case, it had to have been sizable enough to fit most of the early church that was there. In fact, some commentators believe that Mary, her house, is where Jesus is going to institute the, the uh, communion and, and the Last Supper, where we're going to see in the Gospels, that that was her house that took place in. But the general theme is, man, her home was a place of ministry. And I know for a lot of you, you want that for your house. As for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's a, that's a beautiful promise, a wonderful thing that you should aim to, to achieve, that my home exists to be a ministry headquarters for anyone that comes in. And in Mary's case, we see that many are gathering together, and what are they doing? They're praying. Well, what are they praying for? Well, all they know is that James has just died by the sword, Peter is in prison, and they're going through this moment of like, okay, this is reason to freak out news, and so let's not freak out. Let's pray. Let's just stop and pray. But the church, the early church, becomes a powerful example that obstacles should, in fact, create opportunities to stop and pray. Lord, I don't know why this is happening the way that it is, but I'm just, instead of trying to, like, rationalize what's happening, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to give this to you it's effective. It's powerful. It's the first thing that we should do in everything, because I don't think a lot of us realize, truly realize how effective and powerful prayer is. I don't think the early church expected their prayers to be answered in the way that it was, because look what happens in verse 13 through 15, back in Acts 12. Read it with me. As Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. By the way, Rhoda means rose. Are there any roses in here? That's okay. So Rose recognized Peter's voice, and because of her gladness, she didn't even open up the gate, but she ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate, and they said to her, you're beside yourself. The New Living Translation, you're out of your mind, and yet, the text says, she kept insisting that it was so. And so they said, it's just his angel. So they don't believe that Peter's at the door, they conclude quickly, it's just his angel. As if the little girl from, like, It's a Wonderful Life is going to come out of nowhere and be like, listen, Rhoda, teacher says every time the door knocks, an angel gets its wings. That doesn't happen. They look at Rhoda and they're like, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. And she's like, I'm not crazy. He's literally there right now. Let's pretend we're not theologians and scholars here, okay? Let's just entertain the notion that there's an angel out on the door. Like, they're rationalizing. It's just his angel. First of all, why would an angel be knocking on the door? It's like, what's Peter? No, it's Angel Dash. We ordered falafels. They're here. This is good. So, no, but seriously, like, okay, really, if it is an angel, why is it knocking on the door? And if it is an angel, why are you not answering the door? Why are they dismissing this so quickly? And Rhoda, of course, could have easily resolved this by simply opening the door instead of just hearing a voice. It's like, oh, it's him, and running off. And you know what? This is where I think we as a church, we can laugh about because we can relate with what I'm about to say. Think about it. The church is praying that Peter would be released. They are intently and offering constant prayer on Peter's behalf to be released from prison. Lord, we pray if it's your will to release Peter, keep him safe, send angels that way. Look, at, show us a sign for, and then Rhoda comes in, Peter's at the door. Not now, Rhoda, we're praying. Gosh. Anyways, Lord. Guys, it's really him. I, not another word, Rhoda. 
Lord, we pray that Peter would be released. And, you know, and that's exactly what happens. The very thing they pray for happens. And that's funny to me, guys, because we know what the Bible says. In fact, I'll say part of the verse. You finish it. We have not because, because we ask not. And yet when we ask in faith and we see that the prayer has been answered, we look at it as this most amazing thing ever. Like, wait a second. Prayer does work? Man, I should do this prayer thing more often. Now, there's three ways that I think God answers prayers. For the sake of time, yes, I understand there's probably other subcategories that we can create, but for the sake of time and because it's my sermon outline, I'm going to give you three examples on how I think God answers prayers. You ready? They're so profound. You ready? He'll either say yes to something. He'll either say no to something, or he'll say wait for something greater. And let me explain. Because maybe some of you have heard God, or excuse me, maybe you've heard someone say about God, he hasn't answered my prayers. I've been praying all year for this, all, all month for this, and God does not, he's not answering my prayers. Maybe some of you have heard that. When the reality is, I don't think that's true. In fact, Jesus always answers prayers. Let me tell you why. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22 says this. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Again, notice the words, the result of prayers. You will receive. Will receive what? In my opinion, an answer to your prayer. Meaning, and this is where I want you guys to engrave this into your heart. If there's anything else, everything else is dismissed. This is what I want you to remember. You ready? God always answers the prayer. The problem is we don't like the answer sometimes. A lot of times we try to redirect or re change or alter in thinking that we're going to change God's mind in our prayer. Because sometimes the reality is it's just yes, because you prayed according to his will, which should bring up the next question. So then how do I pray according to God's will? And the answer among many is found in scripture. Psalm 37, 4, you can see it on the screen. You ready? How can I pray according to God's will? The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give to you the desires of your heart. Meaning you genuinely spend time with God in his word, in prayer, in fellowshipping with his saints. And as you're seeking him, Lord, I just, I need to know, delight yourself. Lord. He's going to give to you the desires of your heart. And we learned about this last week. We learned how the Holy Spirit shows us how to pray, what to pray for. Remember, we learned about it in Romans chapter 8. And the reality behind that is when we are asking according to his will, the answer is not sometimes, but always revealed. But sometimes Jesus does answer our prayers by asking us to wait, which I know every person in here loves to wait. Or you know what? Sometimes he'll just say no to something because it's not in his will. Think about it now in application to what we're reading here in Acts 12. The early church in Jerusalem had to have prayed for the safety of James. And yet he was still beheaded. They very much could have prayed, Lord, we ask that you would keep him safe. And that's not to say that God's will was for him to die because he's an evil, terrible God. The result is, and we talked about this last week, we live in a fallen world. We live among sinners. And so the, the reality is, Lord, we pray that James' safety would happen, and it doesn't happen. God was still working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And for a lot of you, if you can't even accept that truth in your own life, it's going to be very hard for you as a Christian because you try to rationalize or understand why things happen, and there are times when you are just never going to know why things happen the way that they happen. And this is where faith becomes a powerful thing. Do you trust the Lord enough to believe that even if you don't have the answer, that you will serve him? I don't know the answer, Lord, but I, I, I want to keep my eyes on you. The reality is God has editing rights over our prayers, meaning you can pray, turn that prayer into God, and uh, the reality is God then can have the right to, you know, edit it according to his will. And sometimes he'll ask you to resubmit a prayer, which is very frustrating, <laughs> Like, for example, um, I met Carolyn, my wife, when we were 11. 
So I met her just shy of uh, 25 years ago. Yep, do the math. And uh, we, I knew I was going to marry her when I was a junior in high school. And my senior year in high school, I graduated June of 2004. I used my graduation money to buy the wedding ring. And I was ready, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to marry this girl. I love Carolyn. And as I was getting ready, the Lord said, don't propose to her. And I remember thinking, like, that's so weird because I know this is the girl. And the Lord said, you can't propose to her yet. Now is not the time. Which is a very hard thing, by the way, for an 18-year-old. Because I'm just like, <laughs> but the Lord gave this explicit instructions. If you propose to her now, you are in disobedience to me. Okay, so then I waited and I waited. I had her ring for five months until finally... The Lord said, now you have the clear propose. And to, you know, to a lot of your shock and amazement, she said yes when I proposed. And I remember telling her, like, I've, I've had the ring for five months, Carolyn, and I've been wanting to propose to you, but the Lord told me not to. And she's like, really? I was like, yeah, it's crazy. And she's like, no, I mean, that's crazy because if you would have proposed to me when you wanted to, I would have said no. I'm like, what? And then I said, listen, contracts are legal and binding in the state of Colorado when you verbalize something. You're stuck with me. No, but then I asked, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, honestly, the Lord was working in my heart because I had ideas and things that I wanted to do. And if you would have done it at that moment, I would have said no to you. But God has been in these last five months rocking my world and prepping me for this moment. I was like, did you see this coming? Did you know that this was going to happen? She's like, well, I knew you were going to propose eventually, but I had no idea that this was the day. And you look at that, and it's just like, wow, Lord, thank you for averting me from doing what was your will, but not in that moment. Another example is we church planted in 2012, and I was here at this church, and I thought I was going to go to Boulder, Colorado to start the church. And I went to Boulder, and I waited in the city. I'm praying over the city, and I'm like, this is where I'm going to start a church. And I was set, and I'm excited. I'm like telling people, like, it's going to be Boulder. And about three weeks into praying over the city, the Lord said, you're not supposed to church plant in Boulder. And that was frustrating, especially because I was convinced. I'm like, Lord, what an oppressive city. What a city that just needs the gospel. And the Lord said, if you pursue the city, you are in disobedience to me because I'm using someone else to pursue the city and you're not that person. Fast forward into the future, I church plant in South Carolina and I find out a new church plant takes place in Boulder by a pastor named Kevin Utilly. And I reached out to him and I'm like, bro, you're the guy God was telling me about that he was working on his heart to come out here. We exchanged stories and, and then I moved back here and now I'm serving on his board and now I'm able to see what, how God is using him in the city that I was convinced we were supposed to church plant in and how powerful it was to see that full circle of like, Lord, what would have happened if it was me? I would have been in disobedience. And now fast forward now and here to the here and now. I look at you guys and I'm just thanking God that I didn't go in Boulder because to be honest with you, I probably would have stayed. South Carolina, I got a call from my dad to come and take over the church. Hey, John, let's work on a transition plan. I want you to take over the church. And I'm looking now at you guys, thanking God that he made the answers to my prayer revealed in the way that he did because I, I'm just, I love this church. I love you guys. I love the staff here. I'm so thankful that God's called me to be a, uh, the one shepherding this church and leaving you guys under my care. Sometimes... Jesus answers our prayers by asking us to wait. And here in Acts chapter 12, the church is continuing to pray for Peter's release. And Peter is still knocking at the door. Look at verse 16 of Acts 12. Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. Well, why do you think they were astonished? I mean, I, well, think about it. The church is gathering to pray for his release that God would in fact do so, and then that's exactly what happens. Their prayers are answered. Yes, they don't believe that Rhoda was telling the truth when she said Peter was at the door. So why were they astonished that their prayers were actually answered? James once talked about this in his little epistle, James chapter 1. He told us when we ask Jesus for something, James 1, 6 tells us to let him ask in faith, 
with no doubting. Now look what it says concerning the person who doubts. He says, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And that, that, that's why I'm, I'm looking at James chapter one and I'm applying Acts chapter 12, what we're reading right now. The church is praying for his release. They hear a knock, knock. Who's there? Peter, Peter who? Peter who just broke out of prison and wondering why you're asking all these questions. Open up the door, open it up. But if they apply to James chapter one, in my opinion, approach, knock, knock, who's there? Peter, we've been expecting you. We've been expecting you, and honestly, we were expecting you sooner, but man, we were praying for this very thing to happen. The church is astonished, but they're not speechless, because look what Peter has to tell them to do in verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, because they're probably screaming, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, now go tell these things to James and to the brethren, and he departed and went to another place. Yeah, they're probably astonished. They're probably screaming. They see Peter and they're like, Peter, Peter. Oh, there you are, Peter. Welcome back to Neverland, Pandemic. That doesn't happen, but it did in my mind. Peter's can't, shh, and he starts explaining everything. I was in prison and an angel broke me out again. An angel, shh, yes, an angel. Okay, listen. You need to tell everyone what has happened. More specifically, you need to tell the brethren what has happened here. And I want you to notice he doesn't take credit. We like to do that when God is so clearly, inexplicitly the reason why something happened in your life. We like to pull this card like, well, I heard from the Lord because I hear from the Lord so well. <laughs> kind of thing. Like Peter doesn't do that. He doesn't, he's not like, well, it so happens. My chains fell off and when the guards weren't looking, I just booked it. Or it so happens I watched Shawshank Redemption and pulled an Andy Dufresne, put a hole in the wall and escaped. None of that happens. He gives credit fully to God. Basic principle, ladies and gentlemen, that we really need to apply to our prayer life. You ready? After your prayer is answered, here's the principle. Give thanks to Jesus. You ready for another principle? When your prayers are not answered in the way that you hoped, give thanks to Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 tells us this. Be anxious for nothing. Some things, John, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, look what the next part. We are called as prayer, as our prayers and supplication are being brought. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Thanking God and praising Jesus in our prayers is imperative. But we have it the other way around. Lord, I'll give you praise and glory if you answer my prayers according to my will. Lord, I'll give you the attention you deserve when you answer my prayers the way that I have asked. But I want you to notice, because anxiety is sometimes the thing that we use to drive our emotions. Paul says the result of, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7 of Philippians and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, basic principle in your prayer life, no matter what, thank him and praise him and allow the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard your hearts and minds. Because here in Acts chapter 12, Peter gives them instruction as he's whispering to them and with hand motions on what happened. Go tell these things to James and the brethren. Bible students in here who were here last Sunday, you're like, but wait a second, I thought James was killed by the sword with, by Herod. Well, in this case, this is a, probably a different James, A, because it has to be, and the speculation is it's believed that it's probably James, the half-brother of Jesus, who, by the way, plays an important picture, a prominent role, excuse me, in the early church in Jerusalem at this time. And so Peter inevitably is like, I'm out, I'm free, this is what happened. Go tell the brethren, go tell James what took place here. And we're told in verse 17, which is kind of a sad verse, and I'll explain to you why. And he departed, and he went to another place. It's a sad verse because, except for a brief mention in chapter 15 of Acts, this is the very last time Luke the author speaks of Peter. You can read about Peter's encounters with Paul in, in Galatians chapter 2, but as far as the book of Acts is concerned, Peter's no longer a prominent character. Now, Saul, who's going to become Paul the apostle, is just going to dominate the remaining chapters of the book of Acts. So, 
Peter's gone. But look what happens in verse 18. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what became of Peter. I, I'm laughing at that because no one talks like that. No one said, you know, it's like there was no small stir among the soldiers, meaning there was like commotion taking place. Uh, I mean, you don't, for you, and I say no one talks like that because you don't enter a room after hearing about the, the hottest gossip that's taking place. You don't say something like, what's all this no small stir taking place? If you talk like that, people will unfriend you on Facebook. They're like, these, that girl's weird. That guy's weird. Who, who talks like that? Well, in this case, there was no small stir among the soldiers, meaning they're freaking out because they Guys, follow me. They, did, they try to do everything they can to prevent an escape, but that's exactly what happened anyways. So they're looking at each other like, I don't even know how this is possible. These two guys were chained to him. These two guys were waiting outside of the gate. These two guys were out near the iron gate. Like, what the heck just happened? Peter escaped, but someone's got to pay. Hey, convincing story guards, but someone's got to pay. Look what happens in verse 19. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So Herod is just furious that his prized possession, prized prisoner, escaped again. And rightfully so, he asks questions, but for some of you, it's like, it doesn't seem really right that the repercussions is killing them. Well, you have to keep in mind, it was customary in that day, if the guard's prisoner escaped, the guard was given the penalty due uh, to, that was due to the prisoner to him. And in the case of Peter, he had, he's in jail waiting to appear before the people and to be killed, which is why Herod examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And a very similar story happened in the 16th chapter of Acts. Do you remember this one? Paul is with Silas. They get arrested. They get beaten up by a mob. They're thrown in jail. And the guard has given instruction, don't let them escape. Because that was their biggest problem back then. Like all the Christians are going to jail, but they're escaping because of angels. It's like, don't let them escape. And uh, while Paul and Silas were in prison, listen to what they're doing. Are they freaking out? Are they compiling a plan on what to do? Acts 16.25, we're told, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Not only that, look what they're doing. They were singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They, they, again, they're looking at this, this obstacle, this crisis, this difficulty, and they turn it into an opportunity to not only pray, but sing unto the Lord to the point that the guards are listening. And the Bible says in that chapter that this earthquake shook and unshackled their chains, opened up the, the gates and the doors to where all the prisoners were, and inevitably the, the guard woke up. And so look what he does. Acts 16, 27 through 28. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we're all here. I want to spend just a quick moment on this. He's ready to kill himself because he's probably remembering what happened to Peter's guards. Herod killed them. And so in his mind, he's rationalizing that death is the best solution. And I, I want to take a really quick moment to talk about this. And I'm, I'm talking about this not just because it's 2020, but it is. I'm seeing the, the, the reality of what 2020 is doing to people. I'm seeing that the reason why I'm so adamant that we meet as a church again is because it's very important to me because it's biblically centered, but also because I recognize that depression has gone up, antidepressants have gone up, and suicide has gone up. And you know what we do? Satan is so demonic in this way of thinking to convince us that the best solution is to end our life. And I need to say it because if, if I don't say it, I'm, I'm going to be so upset your life has value, and even in this moment, if some of you have been contemplating taking your own life, that is a lie. And I get that there are times when you may hear that from other people and you don't know how to respond to it. 
But can I just give you some encouragement? Because the guard in Acts 16 is ready to take his own life. And the next question he asks instead of taking his own life is, what then shall I, what must I do to be saved? Most important question. And Paul gives him the gospel. Check this out. Not only does he give his life, the guard, his life to the Lord, his entire household as a result become Christians because he, he gets saved. The story doesn't end with death, but it ends with life. And now let's consider that now. Let's consider what happened in Acts chapter 12, what we're reading this morning, and what happened in Acts chapter 16. Because follow me for a second. God allowed Peter to escape in Acts chapter 12 and live so that he can continue to win people to Jesus Christ. But God didn't allow Paul to escape in Acts chapter 16 in order that the guard and his entire family would get saved. Now, here's the hard concept that I hope you guys can sow to your heart. In both stories, God is honored still. And that's the problem that we have, is that we measure what's happening in our life. Like, God's not in control, man. Because if God was in control, this would have happened. What if Paul escaped the prison? The guard would have killed himself, is obviously the answer to that. But God prompted Saul to stay in order to use him to give the gospel to the guard. And maybe some of you this morning, you're frustrated because your prayers are not being answered in the way that you hoped for. Please don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. It doesn't mean God isn't answering your prayers. It could very well mean that he just has something greater planned. And as easy as it is for me to say it from the pulpit, just hang in there. Don't just hang in there for my sake. Hang in there because I, I, I truly believe that God desires to reveal truth to you and he doesn't want to withhold it. He wants you to understand what his will is for your life. And I recognize prayer and, and God puts people in our lives for us to understand what that is. Don't dismiss the people in your life that God's put around you because God could very well be using them to minister to you. And number two, don't give up so easily because God is a God of hope and desires for you to know what the answer is. And something greater in this case was planned because the guards are killed and look what happens in verse 20. Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord having made Blastus. Everyone say Blastus. Yes, you're listening, good. And Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So now we're opening up a chapter to the history where Herod and the people of Tyre and Sidon were in a scuffle. Yes, you heard me correctly. I used scuffle in a sentence. And more specifically, we're told that he was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. The problem with Basically, what's happening here is Tyre and Sidon depended on Palestine as their main source of food supplies. And so Herod is basically doing everything he can to make it difficult for them to trade. Sound familiar? So the people, they get together, they find Blastus, and the text tells us, because they knew he was the king's personal aide and friend, they asked for peace. Uh, because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. And so he's, the people are, are like, this is, okay, enough is enough. This is not sustainable. What's happening here? So in any true political fashion, they basically bribed Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bed bedchamber. And what that basically means, like he was the king, in charge of the king's bedchamber, he was like his trusted official, his advisor, his go-to guy. He was like the Dwight Schrute of, of, you know, of this king right now. So Blastus convinced Herod to address the people, and look what happens in verses 21 and through 23. This is very important. On the set day, Herod, arrayed in the royal apparel, sat on his throne, gave his orientation uh, to them, verse 22, and the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he didn't give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. <laughs> like, wait, what? I bet you didn't expect that in church this morning. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> wait, what? He was eaten by worms? Check this out. We have secular historians that help complement everything that we read in the Bible. 
There's a guy by the name of Josephus who was a Jewish historian, and he gave detailed account of how Herod died. He shared everything in gory detail and everything. But Josephus explains that basically Herod uh, was doing all of this during a celebration honoring Claudius Caesar. And we're told that Herod wore this garment to celebrate this occasion. Josephus gives us detail of what it looked like. Follow me. Josephus said this concerning uh, Herod's apparel that day. He put on a garment made entirely of silver and, a, and of a con 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 contexture truly wonderful and came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it shone after a shown out after a surprising manner and was so magnificent as to spread a horror over those that looked intently upon him and presently his flatterers cried out one from one place and another from another though not for his good but that he was a god little g a severe pain also arose in his belly and he began in a most violent manner when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days he departed this life josephus tells us which is kind of an interesting insight to help us understand what's taking place because we we have no idea what he said exactly we have no idea what herod had said but what we do know is whatever was said, he was trying to impress the people. He was trying to present himself as this magnificent, splendorous, most amazing leader in this apparel to come up to them, that of a God. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call idolatry. And God doesn't share in his glory in any way. In fact, listen to this, Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. God doesn't share in his glory with men or women, period. And because of it, Herod was killed by an angel of the Lord. Worms ate him and he died. Yes, that happened in church. Christmas month, you're welcome. Now, with that said, with that said, I do need to preface this because I feel like Christians, you need to hear this, okay? Okay. For whatever reason, there are a group of Christians who hold this position that God hates these people and God hates those kinds of people. And, we, and for a lot of Christians, they, they have this approach that God loves to see the wicked perish. When in fact, God doesn't take pleasure in destroying wicked people. How do you know that, John? Ezekiel 18, 23 and 32, which complements what the New Testament uh, gospel teaches. Ezekiel 18, 23, and 32 says, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. It wasn't like Herod was eaten by worms and died, and the angels in heaven are like, High five, got another one, God. None of that happened. Because it's inconsistent with God's character. The Bible says he desires that none should perish, but all come to repentance. God desires to see, even the people you're thinking about right now, and you're like, if you only knew, John, if you only knew how they oppress me and how they treat me, God loves them. Here's a hard concept. God wants to see them saved. Here's another hard concept. God desired to see Herod turn from his ways and turn to God. Did that happen? No, that didn't happen, but God certainly didn't take pleasure in what took place. And I share that for two reasons. Number one, to give you a glimpse of your own life, because when you think about your own life and how patient God has been with you, am I right? When, when you would label times like, I didn't deserve his mercy, his grace, and his love, and yet he extended it to me. Now apply that to the person that you hate, because I know some of you are thinking of those people. God loves them. God doesn't desire to see them perish, and God doesn't desire to see them destroyed. And I tell you that so that you can have a, so you can approach this thing called life with a heart of, God, I want to love people the way you have called me to love them. Because at one point, you were rebelling like them. Am I right? I was. And maybe for some of you, you're living a life right now where you're in rebellion against God. You're in good company. Because the children of Israel... They were constantly rebelling against God. And, and check this out. I want you to hear how God approached this situation with the children of Israel. 
and what, what he wanted to see from them as a result. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 and 20. I love this verse. God tells the children of Israel, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. And now I call in heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Notice he's not making a choice for them. I'm, no, I'm waiting on, on I'm calling upon the heavens to see the choice that you make. And look, look what he wants you to choose. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Well, what does that entail? And I love this last part of the verse. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. That's the heart of God to see you saved. That's the heart of God. The gospel, man. That's why it's so rich. That's why, man, we're going to give the gospel every time we're here, every Sunday. God loves you and loved you enough to die on the cross for you, to take on the weight of sin that you couldn't attain in terms of righteousness, this righteousness. I want to be right before God. Well, there's nothing we can do to be right before God except through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And by confessing with your mouth that he's Lord and believing in your heart that he died and rose again, this, this is what saves you. Yes, of course, every single time we're going to promote the gospel because every time we see the gospel wanting to be extended out to those in scripture. So even though this may seem like a crazy way to end the chapter, look what it says in the final verses, 24 and 25. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. I actually love the transition of these two verses, verses 23 to 24. In fact, I love it so much, I'm just going to read part of it so that you can hear the flow. You ready? Verse 23, and Herod was eaten by worms and died, but the word of God grew and multiplied. It's kind of a weird dichotomy. Hey, did you hear what happened to Herod? No, what? <laughs> Eaten by worms. Wait, that's horrible. That's awful. Don't worry, because the word of God is going to multiply. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, too. <laughs> the beginning of the chapter ends with, starts with cr a crisis. James is killed. Herod is harassing the church. Peter is in prison. But despite those things, the end is so redemptive. But the word of God grew and multiplied. At the beginning of Acts 12, we're told that the three amigos, or at the end, I should say, uh, Saul, Barnabas, and John Mark, they're heading their way to Antioch to fulfill the ministry God called them to fulfill. And God is using them powerfully, quite literally. You ready? Because God was always in control. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up at this point, and I want to give you a final thought by Warren Wearsby. This thought of, again, you're looking at me still, and you're like, I, I'm still struggling with the concept that God's in control, John. I want to give you a quote to help you understand that even when things seem out of control, there are opportunities to pray, to stop and pray. Listen to what Warren Wearsby said about it. it. I mean, this stuff is gold. I, I read this for the first time last night, and I, I knew we needed to incorporate it. Warren Wearsby once said, When you find yourself sinking in the quicksand, there's little else you can do but cry out to the Lord. And sometimes he allows the quicksand experiences to turn you to him. Wait for God. Acknowledge that he's in control. Give him the pieces of your broken heart and watch him work for you. I love this last part. You can depend on his faithfulness. I completely affirm that. And maybe you need to hear that this morning. Church, you can depend on his faithfulness. You can depend on his faithfulness even when you don't think he's in control. It's kind of like the story of the man who comes to Jesus and his son's demon possessed and he's tried everything and Jesus gives him this hope like, you know, but trust in the son of man and then he's like, well, I believe, but help my unbelief. Sometimes we just need to come to the Lord. It's like, I know what I need to do, Lord, but help me because I, I want to fully trust in your faithfulness confidently. I am hoping before the new year ends that you engrave that, that promise into your heart that he desires to reveal truth to you. And more importantly, we can, in fact, depend on his faithfulness. Ooh.